In a world where both art cinema and Hollywood blockbusters seemed cliched, cinephiles and critics loved to talk about bad movies, low-budget 1950s sci-fi, groundhouse horror and other guilty pleasures, and chase the most obscure, unusual films with jaw-dropping aesthetics or a brilliantly composed soundtrack. In this video, we will touch on the theme of cult horror cinema to explore the roots of the female VAM, revisiting iconic film works and characters. The term VAM was introduced to the American pop culture in the 1915 film A Fool There Was to describe essential femme fatale seductress and Theda Barra is Hollywood's first ever femme fatale and the original screen VAM. The film was based on Porter Emerson Brown's 1909 stage melodrama, which was in turn based in Rudyard Kipling's poem The Vampire. Kipling had been inspired by Sir Edward Byrne Jones's painting of the same name. The story revolved around a temptress who squeezed everything out of men, money, dignity and finally life itself. The Vamp perpetuated the stereotype of European passion and exoticism, but the character created a popular image of women as sensual yet powerful. The Chantress dominated and triumphed over men and opposed sharply with the clean-cut characters portrayed by actresses such as Merrick Pickford and Lillian Gish. Before the rise of hardcore pornography in the mid-1970s, low-budget erotica horror films were mainly aimed to a straight male audience who were lured in the cinema by the promise of provocative themes, mild nudity and softcore scenes. Between 1968 and 1974, there was an extraordinary production of uh, vampire feature films that focused on sensual female characters, mixed in art, horror and erotica. Most of the female vampire movie plots were derived more or less loosely from either Sheridan Le Fanu's uh, short story Carmilla, detailing the love between the eponymous vampire and her young female victim Laura, or from the Countess uh, Elizabeth Bathory, an aristocratic woman of unimaginable cruelty who believed the application of young women's blood would grant internal youthfulness. The movie with the most commentary on the female queer vampire subject is Dracula's Daughter from 1936. The film centers on Countess Zaleska, who we learn is Dracula's daughter and shares his curse, the necessity of drinking human blood. In an interesting twist, Countess Zaleska goes into therapy with psychologist Dr. Garth to cure her obsession. The therapy fails and the Countess determines to make Dr. Garth into her vampire companion. She lures him into her castle in Transylvania and kidnaps his assistant and love interest Janet. The spirit of Zaleska re-emerged in the late 1960s and early 1970s and it follows an uncanny repetitive formula. The monster arises, threatens and feeds and is eventually destroyed by patriarchal figures such as fathers, priests, generals, boyfriends. This formula certainly seems to be the case for all Hammer Studios female vampire films that constantly cater to straight male fantasy. Movies such as The Vampire Lovers, Last for a Vampire and Twins of Evil. Nevertheless, the films failed to provide a satisfactory alternative for women, they reinforce the connection between sexuality and vampirism and ultimately tend to project negative attitudes toward love between women. However, one female vampire film from 1971 changes that narrative as it also showcases that perverse male fantasies can be just as vampiric. Director Jess Franco delivered one of his most celebrated movies, Vampiros Lesbos, in 1971. 
The film is an excellent mixture of breathtaking camera work, sleazy horror suspense, sexy erotic scenes and a brilliant soundtrack. Soledad Miranda, the star of the movie, has a screen presence that radiates the vampire's charm with extreme novelty. Arguably, her performances for Jess Franco in general confirm that the director's female characters function to destabilize patriarchal structures and establish a queer positive symbolism. In his attempts to be both hip and horrific, Vampirus Lesbos reverses much of the iconography associated with the vampire genre, such as bats and wolves, to replace them with psychedelic shots of red kites and flying butterflies. The movie's brilliant score, a mixture of jazz pianos with psychedelic fuzz guitar, boogaloo bass lines and funky beats, has its first take of popularity in the mid-1990s, especially when the song The Lions and the Cucumber was picked by Quentin Tarantino for his third film Jackie Brown and it massively influenced various other artists. A similar theme is also followed in two more films from 1971, Rec Film for a Vampire and Daughters of Darkness. Directed by Belgian academic and cinema scholar Harry Kummel, Daughters of Darkness has been referred to as a queer vampire art film. Similarly to Vampires Lesbos, the central female protagonist is caught in a love triangle between two vampires. Although both the Countess and Stefan share an attraction to pain and death and both contend for Valerie, Stefan is represented as a brutal and unsympathetic man while the Countess is portrayed as a sophisticated, intelligent, motherly and fascinating woman. On the other hand, Jean Roland's film Requiem for a Vampire focuses on the love between two women. The movie seems to run contrary to the conception that vampirism is a perversion because sexual perversion is associated most fully not with the vampires but with the predatory humors of the film. Even though the 1970s cinematic female vampire movies were made by men for men, the 1970s saw the cinematic queens come sprinting out of their closet even if they didn't run into the most flattering light and there was still a long way to go when it came to representation. Screen vampires teach us how to be liberated and that no one should ever be ashamed of their body, sensuality or sexuality. Okay? <laughs> Thank you.